Hello, could somebody please confirm that you can hear me? I can hear you. Yes. Great. Is my voice okay? Yes. It sounds a little worse to me and I'm not sure why that's the case. Um, okay. I want chapter uh, 13 and chapter eight, seven. Today is our last lecture and we will see how far we get in chapter seven. Uh, any material we don't cover will not be on the final. Any questions about that? If not, let me begin. Let me share my screen. Yep, I don't have the link anymore. Scroll down. So today is December 1st. I need to scroll a little further. And we're supposed to be starting chapter seven. We have to finish chapter 13. There is no lab for today. You're supposed to be uh, working on your unknown project report and your unknown project if you need to. Uh, the project report is due Saturday, December 3rd at 11.59 p.m. Remember your unknown notes pages close uh, right before midnight on uh, Friday. So if you want to update your unknown notes page, make sure you get it done before midnight on Friday night. Now, midnight, is that... <laughs> I don't remember. Midnight, I think, is Friday. We'll say 11.59 p.m., and then that's certainly Friday. Uh, remember, we're having the final. It starts Tuesday night at 8 p.m. It must be finished by Wednesday, December 7th at 8 p.m. Heavy, heavy coverage of chapters 7, whatever we cover today, chapter 13, chapter 14, and then lab module 9. And I should mention there will be probably one or two questions about the lab report. Any questions about any of that? Any questions about the final? I will be in the lab to answer questions from 6.30 to 6.45. But if you have no questions, you don't need to, to log in. And after 6.45, I'll be logging out. I do note that I've gotten a lot of grading done. Almost everything is graded. Where's the other one? Uh, I haven't graded uh, two uh, assignments. Did I say lab? I lecture and lab. Two assignments that were turned in late. I was hoping to get those done uh, this morning, and I didn't get that done, so I'll try and get that done. And most of the other labs are done. Meaning I've graded all the labs for two times. I do need to grade the, the um, big project, the infectious disease project. And I hope to get started on that on Friday and hopefully finish it maybe on Sunday. It takes a long time to do that assignment. Any questions about any of that? All right, if not, let me go to where we were. Will you also be changing our quiz five grade two this weekend? Oh yeah, um, I need to up uh, manually figure out which quiz will be dropped and then put that in the drop quiz column. And then also, uh, change quiz five so it'll be worth the full amount i think it's like 75 points something like that it's in the syllabus what it is um so yeah i need to do that too i got all the quizzes graded though so not too bad um i hope to get that done this weekend 
All right. So we were talking about the multiplication of retroviruses. Let me blow this up. Uh, retroviruses are an RNA virus. In fact, they are a single strand RNA genome, and they're a positive single strand RNA genome. You don't need to know this, but retroviruses actually have two strands, both of which are positive RNA strands. And I don't know why that does that. It just has a, a, a duplicate in there. Uh, so there's two copies of the genome in the virus. And it has the enzyme reverse transcriptase, which makes single-strand DNA from uh, the positive single-strand RNA. And then the reverse transcriptase makes the single-strand DNA double-strand DNA. And then that... Uh, double-stranded DNA will be transcribed to make more of the positive single-strand RNA, which is the genome of the virus. And then that positive single-strand RNA will be uh, translated into the capsid proteins, which will get together with the copies of the genome, the positive single-strand RNA virus, to make the new progeny virions and they will bud out of the cell, or usually out of the cell membrane. So this slide is trying to show you the life cycle of a retrovirus, and I can't get that out of the way, where the virus binds to the cell membrane of a cell and then is brought inside I think by endocytosis, does that say in there? It doesn't say, okay. And then the uh, single strand, positive strand RNA is made into viral DNA. First single strand DNA, and then the reverse transcriptase takes the single strand DNA and and makes double strand DNA. And that's an odd enzyme when you think of it. It reads RNA to make single strand DNA. And then that enzyme reads single strand DNA to make double strand DNA. I don't know of any other enzyme that does that. The double strand DNA then will move into the nucleus and it will combine with the DNA of the host, making a provirus. And this provirus will continue for the lifespan of the cell, meaning the DNA that integrates into the chromosome will stick around for the lifetime of this cell. It never comes out. Any questions about that? Uh, this is a problem with AIDS and that is the DNA of the virus will integrate into the host chromosome. And even though we think the patient might be cured, we do have a few patients who they think they are cured. We have no evidence that they have the HIV virus in them, but it could be in one or a few of their cells, in which case we wouldn't know it until it comes out. And now it's possible that that cell would die, in which case the HIV virus would die in the patient. And for those patients that we think might be cured, uh, that's probably what happened. The, the cell that it integrated into died. Uh, the virus will then transcribe, making the viral RNA genome, its positive single-strand RNA, so that RNA can be translated into the viral proteins, which will then get together with the viral genome to make the new virions, which will then bud out of the cell. And I don't remember if I mentioned this or not. With retroviruses, usually the retrovirus does not kill the cell. The budding is not at a level that the cell cannot handle a little bit of membrane being ripped off to become the envelope of the virus. 
So the cell survives the budding of the virus. Usually that's the case. How the cell dies is the immune system recognizes that this cell is infected. My mouse has died. This cell is infected. And then the immune system may kill this cell. But usually the retrovirus does not kill the cell. Any question about any of that? All right. So this explains why retrovirus are an exception. They are an RNA virus, but they do not replicate in the cytoplasm. It's because the RNA virus is made into viral DNA, which then moves into the nucleus and integrates with the host DNA and then replicates. Okay, so retroviruses are the one exception of an RNA. They don't follow the rule of thumb. They do not replicate in the cytoplasm. They actually replicate in the nucleus. Any question about any of that? All right, if not, that's it for retroviruses. Let's move on to coronaviruses. They are single positive strand RNA viruses. They also have an envelope. They actually were very well known to scientists before COVID-19 because coronaviruses are the second most common cause of the human cold. They also cause some other diseases similar to COVID-19, such as SARS and MERS. You may have heard of SARS. It stands for Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome. It's a possibly lethal disease. It first appeared in 2003 in China, and it spread to a few other countries, including a few cases in the United States and Canada. But fortunately, the medical community got control of it, isolated these patients, and they kept SARS from spreading. SARS uh, appeared once, bef once later in China once again, and I think China got control of it and never spread beyond China. The problem with SARS is it's more lethal than COVID-19, but the good thing is it uh, doesn't seem to have many, if any, cases which are asymptomatic. So we could isolate the people who are infected and then control those who had SARS. And that prevented SARS from spreading. COVID-19, if you don't know, is actually similar to SARS. In fact, its name is actually similar to SARS. Um, however, it has a lot of asymptomatic patients, particularly among people your age. Most of you are young adults or teenagers or children. And the young people are have a very high uh, incidence of asymptomatic carriers of COVID-19, where they have COVID-19 and it's reproducing in them and they can spread it, but they have no signs or symptoms that they have COVID-19. And that's actually how it came into the United States. If you remember, uh, President Trump at the time put on quarantines. Nobody from China could even come into the country. And uh, the disease still came into the country. Any questions about any of that? All right. The other disease, uh, coronavirus, that's similar to COVID-19 is MERS. MERS and SARS are similar. MERS has the highest mortality rate. The mortality rate is actually about 36% of patients who get MERS die. But fortunately, MERS does not spread among people. So when a person gets it, they don't spread it to other people. Uh, most of the patients who come down with MERS, uh, sorry, my internet connection is telling me it's unstable. Um, so if you're having trouble, 
uh, just ask me to repeat something. I don't know what the problem is. Um, it's not me, it's the internet connection. Anyways, MERS doesn't spread, and most of the patients who get MERS get it from a camel. And I don't know about you guys, but I am almost never, and in my entire life, almost never have I been around a camel. I think there was one in a petting zoo I went to. But other than that, I'm not around camels very much. COVID-19 is lethal, and the lethality rate, the last numbers I got, were they were estimating it was lethal in 0.2% to up to 3% of patients who get infected could die. And I think this is of the earlier strains of COVID-19. The later strains are less lethal, lethal but they still are lethal. Uh, the problem with COVID-19, besides that it's lethal, is it spreads much more easily than the flu. And it used to be one person was likely to infect one to 2.5 other people. I think with the later strains of the virus, it's even spreading more easily. And so it's higher than these numbers. Any question about any of that? And even though, well, let me go on to talk about the lethality. We're gonna skip ahead here. The lethality of uh, uh, COVID-19, 0.02% to 3%. When I got this number, which was actually in 2021, about 1.8% 1 of the people who got infected in the United States were dying. In some countries, the death rate is higher. And in some countries, the death rate is lower than it shows in the United States. The highest death rate is from Mexico. And I don't remember where the lowest death rate is. Uh, there's a number of factors that affect the death rate, including the age of the people. So a country that has older people are going to have a higher death rate. And then there's a few other things. Um, the strain of the virus that gets you can affect the death rate and uh, the health of the patient. Oh, and then the race of the patient. For example, Blacks and Hispanics are much more likely to die than whites and Asians. And they don't know why that is the case. And it's certainly seen, at least in the United States and Canada, that Blacks and Hispanics are more likely to die. And the number is almost twice as high than whites and Asians. It has, just has to do something to do with the virus. It's more lethal in those races. Any question about any of that? Oh, I did mention the strain of the virus affects the lethality. The most lethal strain of the virus was actually the Delta virus, which was not the first. It was the fourth or the fifth variant that came out. And then the least lethal that I know of, although all of the last strains coming out have been less lethal, was the Omicron variant. But even though the Omicron variant was less, less lethal than the Delta variant, Omicron killed more people than the Delta variant. Does anyone have a reason why? Why did Omicron kill more people than the Delta variant? Come on, it's actually very simple. Nobody's going to hazard a guess. Can I just confirm that people can hear me? Is it because of the mutations that the virus goes through? Um, the virus does go through mutations, and that's why Omicron was less lethal 
than the Delta variant. In fact, the Omicron variant is a, a derivative of the Delta variant. However, it had many mutations, and I think it also had a recombination with another, with another, um, what would that be? Another, another variant of the uh, COVID-19, something like that. I don't remember. Uh, no, it, it's because uh, Omicron killed more people than the Delta variant because many more people came down with the infection of Omicron than they did with Delta. And so Omicron killed more people. And part of the reason why Omicron uh, infected more people was it was less lethal, so people weren't as worried about it. And it also was more contagious than the Delta variant. So it was easy, more easily to spread. And if you think about that, I already mentioned COVID-19 was more spread more easily than the flu. The flu spreads pretty easily. And uh, COVID-19 spreads much more easily than the flu. And then the Omicron variant spread much more easily than the Delta variant, which spread very easily. So that's just something to think about. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the uh, COVID-19. It's related to the bat coronaviruses, and it likely originated from the bat coronaviruses. They've sequenced COVID-19, and they think it actually was a recombination of two different bat coronaviruses that recombined with the third coronavirus that in, was a, a pangolin coronavirus. The pangolin uh, genome is only about 10%, and it codes for the spikes of the coronavirus. They think COVID-19 came out of the bats and actually uh, infected a pangolin. It might have been just one. If you don't know what a pangolin is, it's a spiny anteater. And then the pangolin, they think, introduced it to humans. Uh, the COVID-19 came out of a, uh, or appears to have come out of a food market in China, where in the market they had many exotic animals, including pangolins for sale, and people would come into the market and buy the food in the pangolins. I don't know if they were living or dead. I've never been to a Chinese market. And then um, go home and eat it. And it's not necessarily the eating of the pangolin that got it, because the cooking would kill it. But uh, uh, probably the virus came out of the pangolin and then infected the first human, which might have been the buyer of the pangolin. But it could have been either the person selling the pangolin or somebody who even just looked at the pangolin. And then the virus. Uh, spread to humans and started spreading among humans. That's what they think happened. And like I said, when they sequenced the original COVID-19, it does look like it was a recombination of three different coronaviruses, two bat and one pangolin. Uh, COVID-19 primarily spreads by droplets from a cough or a sneeze within a range of about six feet. It may spread further than six feet, although it's less likely, and it may spread by indirect contact from via contaminated surfaces, like if somebody sneezes and then touches a doorknob, it can spread that way. But for whatever reasons, COVID-19 does not tend to spread by contaminated surfaces. It tends to spread directly via airborne droplets. And you don't have to get a cough or a sneeze to get it. Uh, it. Particularly people in the choir have gotten it. So apparently singing uh, tends to release the virus as well, as well as talking, although less likely. 
Uh, COVID-19 is mostly breathed in, although rarely it can be picked up by the hands and then carried to a mucous membrane in the face. It can survive for three days, the virus, on plastic or metal surface, but on paper and cardboard, it only stays alive for a day. So if you really want to make sure you don't get COVID-19, you're taking precautions, what you should do with your mail is let it sit for a day at room temperature and then open your mail. Uh, I used to be very careful like when I bought groceries and things like that, and I'm not careful about groceries anymore, okay? I do, I'm a little more careful if the groceries are put in a plastic bag because they can live on plastic for a long time. And if it's in the refrigerator, it can live longer than three days. In the freezer, COVID-19 can actually live for a very long time. Symptoms of COVID-19, it's mostly flu-like, though runny nose and sneezes are less common than the flu. Shortness of breath and deaths are more common. Mortality rate increases with age, the ill health of the patient. Uh, mortality is more common in men than in women. And mortality is more common with Blacks and Hispanics. The incubation period from when you're first exposed to when you get First symptoms take two to 14 days. But remember, some patients are asymptomatic, especially young people. And I don't know if I mentioned, they believe that one third to maybe one half of young people who become infected with COVID-19 will be asymptomatic. So that's a large number of patients who are asymptomatic. Prevention, use correct hand washing, keep your distance from people, especially if they're coughing, and then don't touch your face with your hands until you've washed your hands. If you're sick, you should wear a mask and best to stay home so you don't spread the virus. Any question about any of that? All right, let's briefly talk about viruses and human cancer. Some human cancers are believed to be caused by a virus. And this is about 10 to 15% of human cancers. There are some examples which are very commonly caused or at least initiated by a virus. Like a human papilloma virus causes cervical cancer and skin cancer. Hepatitis B virus and hepatitis C virus are known to cause liver cancer. Not all cancers though are caused by a virus like human breast cancer and glioblastoma are not associated with viruses, at least among humans. Any question about that? I'm not going to talk about what cancer is. It's just uncontrolled growth. Uh, there's two ways that viruses can cause cancer. The virus can form a provirus where the viral genome integrates into the host cell's chromosome. In uh, animal viruses, when this happens, it permanently becomes a genetic change in the cell that viral DNA never leaves, and that creates changes in the DNA. You could mutate a gene by the viral DNA inserting, or you could turn on a gene uh, that was normally turned off. Anyways, it creates a permanent change in the cell. The other way a virus can cause cancer is the virus can bring an oncogene to the cell. An oncogene is a new mutated a form of a normal cellular gene involved in cell growth. So we have these genes which control the cell's growth and an oncogene is a mutated normal 
cellular growth chain that is not the growth is not regulated so the cell keeps growing okay uh, do you understand that uh, mutated oncogenes help transform no more cells into cancers um, the gene can be transferred into the cell by the virus and we call it an oncogenic virus because it contains the oncogene and then that oncogene will be expressed and it will cause the cell to uh, um, to grow uncontrollably. So those are the two ways that a uh, virus uh, are known to cause cancer by changing the DNA of the cell and then bringing into the cell an oncogene causing the cell to grow uncontrollably. Now, let me state the oncogene does not change the cell into a cancer, and this is beyond your level, so you don't need to know this. A cancer uh, cell needs several changes. I don't remember if it's five or six. The oncogene would only be one, but it starts the process to make the uh, tumor. All right, any questions about any of that? All right, so we've mentioned that uh, animal cells have two life cycles, the lytic life cycle and the budding life cycle. Well, let me state there's another life cycle, a latent life cycle, a latent viral infection is where the virus remains in the patient, but the patient is asymptomatic for long periods of time. When the virus is latent, the virus does not cause disease. Actually, the virus is sort of, what do you call that, dormant when it is latent. And then the virus can leave the latent life cycle and then enter another life cycle, usually the budding life cycle. The virus becomes active and then it can cause disease such as cold sores and shingles. Shingles is the virus that causes chicken pox. When a child is first infected with chicken pox, or I guess it could be an adult, the first time they get it, it, it gives you the symptoms of chicken pox. The virus then goes latent, where the virus hides out in the patient's cells, not causing disease. And the virus is actually pretty dormant. It's still present, but it's not doing much. And for this virus, the chickenpox or the shingles virus, it can go latent for years or decades. Usually what happens is the child will get chicken pox. And then when the child is in old age, the virus will leave latency and enter the budding life cycle. And then the patient will be, get shingles. So the chicken pox or shingles virus is a very good example of latency. And the virus is oftentimes latent for decades. All other, well, after the, uh, the after the shingles and the shingles go away, the virus leaves the budding life cycle and re-enters the latent life cycle. All further infections will cause shingles. And that will be when the virus leaves the latent life cycle and enters the budding life cycle. The triggers for causing the virus to leave the latent life cycle and enter the budding life cycle is usually a stressor. And for cold sores, the stress is usually getting a cold. It can be something else, but it, it's oftentimes getting a cold, and that's why we call it a cold sore, because the sore comes out when the patient has a cold. Any question about any of that?
All right, there's one other life cycle and it's a persistent viral um, life cycle. Um, let me see if what we're talking about here. Yeah, we don't need to talk about the life cycle. Let's just talk about a persistent viral infection. This is a disease, a viral disease that occurs over a long period of time. Detectable infectious virus is initially very low and stays low for a long time, but with time, the viral load gets higher and higher until uh, over a long period of time, uh, the viral load may bloom or else it just climbed very gradually over time. In a persistent viral infection, the virus is never cleared by the host immune system. A persistent viral infection may be fatal. An example of this is subacute sclerosing panencephalitis, which is actually caused by the measles virus. But I doubt any of you have heard of panencephalitis. If you had, good, good job for you. Another example is AIDS used to be a persistent viral infection where the patient would get more and more viruses over time. And then they would go over a threshold and they'd start having signs and symptoms of AIDS. And in the past, most of the patients would die from the persistent viral infection of HIV causing AIDS. Okay, nowadays we have medication to keep the patient alive for close to the normal lifespan of the patient. So I don't know if, well, in most cases, it would be a persistent viral infection because the, the virus is never uh, cleared from the host immune system. It's just the patient never gets really, really sick and doesn't die of AIDS. Uh, many persistent viral infections are tolerated like CMV, cytomegalovirus, varicella zoster, the virus causing chickenpox and shingles. My mother had a persistent viral infection with uh, varicella zoster. She was one in a thousand patients where the shingles never went away. Most patients, it will come and then go away. So it's not a persistent viral infection in most cases. And then there are a few other herpes virus which are persistent viral infections. Any question about any of that? All right, let me show you. Normally in a viral infection, it's an acute viral infection where when the patient is first exposed to the virus, the virus load will quickly uh, increase, and in this part, you get the viral signs and symptoms, and then the viral load decreases, and the signs and the symptoms go away, and then the virus ends. It's gone from the patient. So that's an acute viral infection. A latent infection, you get an acute infection. The child gets uh, uh, the chicken pox. And then the virus disappears. It's in the latent life cycle. So we have no sign of the virus in the patient and obviously no signs or symptoms. And then the virus comes out with shingles, in which case we see the latent infection. Okay. The persistent viral infection differs, and that is the uh, viral load starts very low and slowly increases over time. And eventually the viral load blooms, becomes much higher. And you'll notice how the graph is broken. That's because the patient is dying. The patient may not always die, like HIV patients nowadays. Actually, I think most of the time they stay uh, in this range, but they never clear the virus. They have to take the medication for the rest of their life. 
But if they were to get AIDS and then die, this would be a persistent viral infection with AIDS where the patient dies. Any question about any of that? All right, if not, let's, uh, let me ask, are there any questions about viruses? If not, I'm going to start talking about prions. Prions are a weird disease. It's believed, and there is a lot of evidence, that prions are caused by proteins. So prions are a proteinaceous infectious particle. We have a protein which causes the prion disease, and then the consumption of that protein, or I guess you get to get it the, the uh, uh, injection of that protein into your body, or an organ transplant bringing in the protein into your body, or from surgical instruments bringing the protein into your body, the patient gets infected. There's another way you can get a prion disease, and that is where it's inherited, in which case the child inherits the disease from their parent. And I'll explain the disease and how they inherit in just a minute. The prion uh, diseases, the proteins cause spongiform encephalopathy, where there will be vacuoles in the brain, at least in humans and other animals. Let me show you a picture of the brain. There's what a normal brain looks like. Okay. And these are prion brains. These uh, apparently whole looking portions in the brain are what we call spongiform because to uh, somebody who looks at it, it looks sort of like a sponge. Any question about any of that? In animals, the best known example of a prion disease is bovine spongiform encephalopathy, which is more commonly called mad cow disease. But there's also sheep scrapies disease, which actually the sheep farmers in Europe have been fighting for centuries. And then if everyone's ever heard of it, cervid chronic wasting disease is another example. All of them are spongiform encephalopathies, which uh, uh, tend to uh, infect the patient and then cause the patient to uh, weaken and then essentially become immobile and eventually die. And humans, we don't call it spongiform encephalopathy. I don't know why, but we call it Creutzfeldt Jakob disease or Gerstmann Strassler Schenker syndrome. And I'm probably butchering these names because I'm not German, and I think that's um, Czech or German for here. And it's also called the fatal familial insomnia in Kuru. All of these diseases are caused by prions, and these are what we call the prion diseases in humans. Any question about any of that? With the Creutzfeldt Jakob disease, it was uh, inherited among certain families, and it was discovered by two doctors, Creutzfeldt and Jakob, and that's why it's called that after the doctor doctors. And then the same with, um, I'm just going to call it Gerstmann Strassler Schenker syndrome, was discovered by three doctors. Kuru is kind of interesting. I'll talk a little bit more about that in my next slide. Kuru was a disease seen in the Four tribe in Papua New Guinea. There's Papua New Guinea. Let me see if I can blow that up. And that was the region in red where the Four tribe was. 
the disease uh, was transmitted to patients and then the patient lost the ability to walk, lost the ability to swallow or chew, and there'd be drastic weight loss leading to death. How was it, this disease transmitted? Among the four tribe, they had a funeral ritual where people would cook and eat their dead relatives. And if their dead relative died of Kuru, the people who ate the relative would then most likely come down with Kuru. And that's how the disease started spreading in the uh, four tribe. Any question about any of that? Uh, fortunately, actually, uh, uh, mothers noticed that their children, as well as themselves, were getting Kuru after eating their dead relatives. So they actually stopped the uh, consumption of their dead relatives for them and their children. So their Kuru went away pretty much among females and the children. However, the men continued to eat their dead relatives. And then the missionaries came to Papua New Guinea and they discovered Kuru. And they also discovered that the four tribe, at least the males, were eating their dead relatives. And this was anathema to the missionaries. And they put an end to the practice of eating people. Okay, so you can actually um, credit the missionaries for getting rid of Kuru in the four tribe of Papua New Guinea. Any question there? So the missionaries were actually good for something. I think the missionaries discovered this like in the 1930s and the 1940s. It might have been mid-1920s, but around that time. So Kuru is now pretty much extinct because uh, uh, people tend not to eat their the other humans. I already showed you that, so let's move on. Uh, the mechanism of how the disease develops is the prion proteins have two forms of the protein. The first form of a protein is PRP uh, sub C, or is that super, superscript C, which is the normal protein, which the cell needs to make. It's a cell surface protein on nerve cells. And the cells have this gene in them because we need this protein on the surface of the nerve cells. The trouble is the PRPC protein can change its formation of how the protein folds, and it then can be convert into the PRP uh, superscript SC uh, protein. The SC stands for scrapies protein. This protein causes prion disease, which would be scrapies for sheep. And uh, this protein, the scrapies protein, can come up to the normal form of the PRP superscript C protein, and then get this PRP C protein, the normal protein, to fold into the scrapies protein. So now we have two copies of the scrapies protein. Well, the cell is going to say, oops, I don't have enough PRP superscript C protein, so it'll make more of that protein. The trouble is this cell now has two copies of the scrapies protein. One of them can come up to the PRP superscript C and convert it into the scrapies protein. And then the cell will make more of the normal protein. And then that scrapies protein will come up to it and make more of the scrapies protein. This will 
lead to the accumulation of the scrapies protein in the brain cell, forming the plaques, forming the holes in the plaques in the brain, and leading to death of the cell. And then that will cause prion disease. In the patients which uh, are born into a family where they're more likely to get scrapies disease, it turns out they have a normal form of the protein, which is more likely to convert into the scrapies or the prion form of the protein. And usually what happens is the young adults and the children do not get the protein converting into the scrapies protein. But when the patient gets older, the normal protein will convert into the scrapies protein. And then the scrapies protein will make more scrapies protein from the normal protein. And then the prion disease will develop. Um, I'm in class at the moment. Can I talk to you in a little bit? Okay. Sorry. All right. Any question about prion disease and how the prion protein replicates? This is unusual disease about a protein, and this protein can make more of itself from a normal protein. Um, in humans, the most common way of getting scrapies was, of course, to be born with a gene that is more likely to convert into the scrapies protein. And that's the familial family where the scrapies runs in the, not scrapies, the uh, kreutzfeldt jakob disease runs in the families. And the other way is to eat the prion protein. That actually happened in Great Britain when they had the mad cow disease. And there were uh, like a, about 150 British people who came down with scrapies or kreutzfeldt jakob disease. And it was directly linked to their eating of uh, tainted beef meaning prion-infected beef. Any questions about any of that? All right. Just for your information, I won't ask you anything about that. I just think it's curious that there was another animal in Britain that got scrapies disease from eating tainted beef during the mad cow epidemic in England. And about 150 British kitty cats, or what do you call it, zoological cats like lions, came down with scrapies disease. So apparently humans and cats were capable of being infected by consuming beef that had been tainted by mad cow prions. Surprisingly, dogs, which ate pretty much the same food as cats, did not have any cases of prion disease in Britain. All right, any questions about prions? If not, let me talk about uh, briefly about plant viruses and viroids. Plant viruses resemble animal virus in many ways. They cause many diseases that are economically important to farmers, like uh, crops important to farmers, like beans, corn, sugarcane, potatoes. But because of the tough cell wall of plants, uh, plant viruses tend to enter the plant through wounds in the plant or uh, parasites, like a nematode eating on the plant, or a fungus infecting the plant, or an insect eating on the plant. 
and then infected plants can spread the virus, the plant viruses, in pollen and seeds. So the plant viruses can then continue. We're not going to talk about plant viruses any further because they do not cause disease in humans. They only cause diseases in plants. Any question about any of that? All right. Let's then talk about viroids. Viroids are like an RNA virus with the virus missing its protein coat. So a viroid is actually an infectious naked RNA molecule. And the infectious RNA can get in the cell, infect it, and reproduce. I, mean, I don't know how it spreads, but it does spread and then go on to infect another plant cell. Fortunately, viroids are only known to exist in plants. So they are a plant pathogen only. There are no known animal viroids. An example of an infectious plant viroid is the potato spindler tuber viroid, which when the potato plant becomes infected with this viroid, it'll make smaller stunted potatoes instead of the large normal size potato. Any question about viroids? All right, if there's no question about viroids, that's it for chapter 13. Guess I got to save that. All right, let's begin chapter seven. We'll only get started on it. Uh, the major goals are lift here, are mentioned here, and then a rough outline. So know the terms of this lesson, and then be able to discuss the factors that influence microbial death rates, assuming we get to it, and be able to discuss the three main ways in which microbial agents kill or inhibit cells. I don't think we'll get to uh, number four or number five, and I'll have to make sure if that's the case that uh, those questions are not on the final. Let me blow this up. Uh, bacterial populations die at a constant logarithmic rate when the cells are heated or treated with an antimicrobial chemical, meaning for longer exposure time, zero time, we have a thousand, no, excuse me, a million cells alive. One minute time, we have 100,000 cells alive and 900,000 cells died. At two minutes time, we have 10,000 cells alive. Three minutes times, 1,000 cells alive. Four minutes time, 100 cells alive. Five minutes uh, exposure time, 10 cells alive. And six minutes time, one bacterial cell alive. So this means for this population, if we have a million cells, we need at least six minutes, probably a little longer, to kill all the cells. And let's see, what would that be? About seven minutes would kill all the cells. When we look at the time and the log rhythm of the number of microbial survivors, being the log of the number of viable cells, we see that the death rate is constant, logarithmic death rate, where when you go over one unit, you go down one log. That's on a log scale. If you don't use the log scale, you use the arithmetic scale, it's a much more complex 
logarithmic scale. Okay. Any question about any of that? So whatever you have, if you want to kill all the cells and treat it with something, you have to remember that to kill all the cells, you need to treat it for a long enough time. The fewer the cells, the less time you need. That's always the case. The rate of microbial death can be affected by a number of different agents. Of course, the number of microbes present at the beginning time of the treatment will affect how long you need to expose the cells to. The more cells there are, the longer you need to treat the cells to kill all the cells. There are environmental influence that can affect the death rate. For example, the presence of organic matter can affect uh, how quickly the cells die. You should come to realize that when you're dealing with a hospital, hospital specimen, you'll almost always have organic matter around. And that will reduce the effectiveness of the treatment, the antimicrobial treatment. The temperature of the treatment will affect how uh, successful the treatment is. The presence of biofilms will uh, determine how effective the treatment is. Biofilms take much longer to kill all the cells than without biofilms. And then treatment, if the higher the temperature, the uh, more effective the treatment will be. Time of exposure, I've already mentioned that. It has to be long enough to kill all the cells. You will need a much longer time to kill endospores than you will need to kill uh, vegetative cells, the normal parietal cell. And then there are microbial characteristics that can affect uh, the microbial death rate. Uh, endospores is one example. If the cell can make endospores, you're going to have a hard time killing the cells. They will not die easily. For example, if you're just using desiccation to kill the cells, for E. coli, desiccation will easily kill the cells. Certainly a day would kill most E. coli, if not all E. coli. On the other hand, if the cell has endospores, desiccation will not be very effective at killing the cells. And we have endospores that have survived desiccation for thousands of years in the Egyptian mummy mummies, I should say. And if there are endospores, uh, I'm trying to remember, it's something like the longest endospore has survived. It's either 40,000 years or 40 million years. And that was an endospore kept in Antarctica for a long period of time. And then they cut out the ice and, and found the endospore and thawed it. And they found that the endospore was still alive. So the microbial characteristics can affect the death rate. All right, I'm going to just tell you to go ahead and look at the different uh, terminology. Uh, we've covered most of that those topics before. Uh, a biocide or a germicide is a substance that kills bacteria or germs, but it usually does not kill endospores. Bactericides kill bacteria cells, fungicides kill fungal cells, virocides kill or inactivate really uh, viruses. There's also bacteriostasis and this inhibits the growth of microbes, but it does not kill the microbes. Once you remove the bacteriostatic agent, growth might resume. 
Any question about that? And I think we talked about biocide or biocidal and bactericidal, bacteriostatic, when we're talking about antibiotics. Sepsis refers to microbial contamination. Asepsis means the absence of contamination by unwanted organisms. You have learned aseptic techniques in this class. You should realize it's important in surgery to have aseptic surgery to minimize contamination from microbes, from the instruments, from the operating personnel, from the patient themselves, and from the air. Uh, microbial agents tend to kill or inhibit microbes by three mechanisms. The first is you can alter the membrane. If you damage the plasma membrane, lipids, or proteins, you cause the cellular contents to escape from the cell, interfering with normal metabolism and killing the cell. Uh, there's an antibiotic that does that, polymyxin B, puts a hole in the cell membrane, which kills the cell. So it alters the membrane. Another way you can uh, kill cells is to damage intercellular proteins. You denature proteins, especially enzymes, such as by targeting disulfured bridges or by breaking hydrogen bonds it will lead to cell death because the proteins cannot function. Any question about that? The third way you can kill uh, microbes is to damage their nucleic acid. Once you damage the nucleic acid, you'll cause mutations, and this often results in cell death. It's something like five or cell, five or six mutations uh, will kill a cell. All right, there's different methods for microbial control, such as heat, filtration, low temperatures, high pressure, desiccation, osmotic pressure, and radiation. If we have time, we'll talk about each of these. These are physical methods to control microbes. The first method we're going to talk about is heat. All methods of heating kill microorganisms by denaturing proteins and enzymes. Though if you are doing flaming or incineration, you're doing more than just denaturing proteins and enzymes. You're actually turning the cells into char. And of course, that will kill the cell. There are two types of heat, wet heat, and dry heat. Wet heat includes boiling or autoclaving. We'll talk about autoclaving in a minute. And then steaming. There's also dry heat where you're using baking to kill things, or you're flaming something, or you're incinerating something. Dry heat. Oh, I was going to talk about something there. But I think I'll wait until I come to the next slide discussing it. All right. So wet heat or moist heat denatures and coagulates proteins and enzymes. One way to do moist heat is to boil liquids at 100 degrees Celsius that's 212 degrees Fahrenheit, or exposing the microbes to the uh, steam, which steam is usually hotter than that. This kills vegetative bacterial pathogens, most viruses, most, well, actually all fungi, fungal spores, and you can kill all of these with exposure to 10 minutes 
and it's oftentimes much faster, like E. coli, uh, just bringing it up to boiling temperature will kill E. coli. But endospores and some viruses do take longer to destroy. For example, some endospores can survive more than 20 hours in boiling water. So reliable sterilization does not use moist heat unless we're using moist heat in an autoclave. An autoclave uses both steam under pressure, sort of like a pressure cooker, and it's very effective. The increased pressure raises the boiling point of water to higher temperatures than it can normally be achieved. Usually we use steam at 15 pounds per square inch and a temperature of 121 degrees Celsius. 121 degrees Celsius is the temperature that water boils at when water is put under 15 pounds per square inch. We can also use steam, but steam only sterilizes the surface or any area that where the steam can go into and uh, sterilize. But the steam has to come directly in contact with the cell to kill it. Any question about any of that? So with an autoclave, we get pressure at around 121, excuse me, 15 pounds per square inch and 121 degrees Celsius. And after about 15 minutes, all cells will be dead. Although autoclave, uh, not autoclaves, uh, endospores may take longer than 15 minutes to kill all cells but it would kill a lot of cells, a lot of endospores. Any question about any of that? All right, let's move on to pasteurization. Pasteurization was a technique that Louis Pasteur invented. And what he was doing was trying to prevent beer from spoiling. And he discovered that you could reduce the number of spoiling organisms and perhaps killing all pathogens by mild heating sufficient to cause the spoilage microorganisms, but not, not high enough temperature to totally evaporate the alcohol. You got to remember Louis Pasteur invented this for treating beer. The mild heating causes a pasteurization. The mild heating causes uh, spoilage organisms to die by, by denaturation and denaturing proteins. However, uh, it doesn't kill all organisms. Thermiduric organisms, heat resistant cells, frequently survive pasteurization. An example would be Staphylococcus aureus can survive a brief exposure to um, um, beaker pasteurization. We can Pasteurize more than just beer. In fact, pasteurization is most known and best known for the pasteurization of milk. And there's two ways to pasteurize milk. You can heat the milk to 63 degrees uh, Celsius for 30 minutes, or more commonly, at least today, you can heat the milk to 72 degrees Celsius for 15 seconds. The milk can be sterilized 
And then we call it ultra high temperature milk, UHT. And that's heating the milk above 140 degrees Celsius. This milk does not require refrigeration because all the microbes in it are killed. Uh, so that way it can be packaged and then put on the shore, the shelf of the store and last and good will be good for several months, maybe up to a half a year, maybe even longer. That is ultra high or UHT milk. It is not pasteurized. It is something similar where we're subjecting it to ultra high temperature. When you're, when you're drinking pasteurized milk, you should realize you are drinking microbes. However, these microbes are not human pathogens. And that's why it's safe to drink that milk. Any questions about any of that? All right, if not, let's talk about dry heat. Dry heat kills by oxidation. Examples of dry heat are flaming, incinerization, and hot air sterilization more commonly called baking. For baking, items are placed in an oven at 100 degrees, 170 degrees Celsius, and it takes two hours exposure to sterilize the baked item. So two hours of dry heat is equivalent to, oh, well, that's pasteurization. Let me come back here. to about 10 minutes of boiling. So it's obvious that wet heat is more efficient. The reason why wet heat is more efficient is the wetness is more likely to transmit the heat to the item being sterilized. Whereas dry heat, you only get, uh, well, dry heat from an oven, you only get uh, a sterilization through the air and it's not as good. That's why you need up to two hours to sterilize an item. This cat is trying to show you that dry heat is not as effective as wet heat. Why? The cat jumped into the oven to get warm. So obviously this is not burning the cat, but the cat would never jump into wet heat, boiling water, or steam coming off the boiling water, because that could burn you immediately. Whereas the oven at 170 degrees Celsius does not immediately burn the cat. In fact, the cat enjoyed it. That's why it jumped in the oven, although that might not be 170 degrees. Any question about any of that? All right. The last method we'll talk about, physical method for uh, controlling microbial growth, is filtration. Filtration is good for liquids and gases where you filter something, which will be connected in this container down here, and the microbes are caught by the membrane pore. So the microbes don't get past the membrane. Filtration is very good for some liquids, probably most liquids, and then air. It does not work on solids because you can't filter it. And it does not work on milk because milk has so many milk proteins and other large molecules in it, as well as the uh, droplets of fat if it's is it pasteurized, something or other, uh, pasteurized milk? And those droplets and the particles in the milk will clog the milk filter, meaning the filter, and then you don't get any more filtered milk. So uh, filtration is best used on some liquids and gases. 
All right, any questions about any of that? If not, I think I'll, well, let me talk briefly about low temperature. Low temperature inhibits microbial growth, but it does not necessarily kill the microbes. You can have refrigeration, and uh, uh, the trouble with refrigeration is psychotrophs can grow and survive in it. And that's why when within a week, you can get one cell climbing to 2 million, even at refrigeration temperature. And that's why food that's a week old or longer in the refrigerator should be thrown out unless it has some other form of preservative, such as high salt or sugar content. Freezing stops metabolic activity, but it may not kill all cells, it, it usually does not. At least slow freezing, as well as quick freezing by liquid nitrogen. Slow freezing is just your normal freezer. Ice crystals can form in bacteria that's uh, frozen in a slow freezer, meaning a normal home freezer, but it doesn't kill all bacteria. So only about 50% of the bacteria would be killed by slow freezing. All right, any questions about any of that? If not, this is where we'll finish. You don't need to know anything later in the chapter for the final. Any questions? If there's no questions, I'll say goodbye. And if you're in the lab, I'll see you. If you're not in the lab, uh, good luck with the final. Bye.